Okay, so welcome everyone. My name's Nicole Covey. I am the lead of NADSEN's Emerging Leaders Node. And I'm very excited for this event today. Um, it's the first event in our revamped Emerging Ideas series in which our emerging scholars get to present their research alongside seasoned academics and or practitioners. Um, as much as I could talk about the amazing work that the ELN and NADSEN is doing, in the efforts of saving everyone's time, I'm going to hand the floor over to our illustrious moderator, uh, Gabriella. Uh, go ahead. All right. Well, I'll echo the welcome to everyone here so far. Um, I'll be moderating today's discussion as part of the Emerging Leaders Node event. And so today we're going to be celebrating 65 years of NORAD with some wonderful panelists, and we're excited to hear their reflections and comments on this key binational defense organization. So as a reminder, we're on Zoom, this event's being recorded. So I'll ask that while the panel presenters are speaking that you could mute your microphones and type your questions in the chat and maybe mention who you want to direct your question to. And after the panelists conclude their remarks, we'll turn to the audience for an open Q&A. And with us today are four scholars who will comment on how NORAD and the Canada-US continental defense relationship has evolved over the past 65 years and how it could evolve in the next 65. So first we have Dr. Richard Goyet, a professor in the Department of Defense Studies at the Canadian Armed Forces College. He has researched and taught extensively on many topics, including military history, Canadian external relations, war and society, and command courses at several civilian and military universities. We also have Dr. Andrea Sharon, an associate professor at the University of Manitoba, a network coordinator for NADSEN, and the director for the Center of Defense and Security Studies. Dr. Sharon has written extensively on NORAD, Arctic security, and Canadian defense policy. We also have Dr. James Ferguson with us. He's a professor at the University of Manitoba and a deputy director of the Center of Defense and Security. His work has broadly focused on strategic studies, Canada-US defense relationships, and Canadian defense policy broadly. He and Dr. Sharon has recently published a book called NORAD and Perpetuity and Beyond that is a must read for anyone attending this, so please get it if you haven't already. And last but certainly not least, we have Nicholas Glesby, an MA candidate in political studies at the University of Manitoba and a fellow at NADSEN. His research is looking at the Permanent Joint Board of Defense. So without further ado, I'll pass it off to our first panelist, Dr. Richard Goyet. You'll have around 12 to 15 minutes. Thanks very much, uh, Gabriella. I've, I've got only two slides, so I'm just going to take a second here to do the share screen on Zoom. Here we go. All right, um, first, if, thanks very much to uh, uh, Nicole Akavi and uh, Whitney Lockenbauer and the rest of the, the Nadsen team for giving me an opportunity to, to speak on this panel today. Um, unfortunately, I have another engagement uh, relatively soon, so uh, I'll have to duck out a, a little bit early. Um, might not be able to take part in the in the Q and A section. Um, today, my look at NORAD is going to be mostly historical and looking back at the most important precedents set when NORAD was actually first stood up. I'm going to start by first recounting my first NORAD experience when I was a young graduate student many years ago. I won't say how long, but let's just say it was before 9/11. And it was during a tour of the NORAD uh, Command Center in Cheyenne Mountain uh, in Colorado Springs, where I came to an important realization. Before, I didn't really understand or appreciate NORAD or the important continental defense relationship between Canada and the United States. But during the tour, when I was in the mountain, I got it. Um, I got it by seeing the American and Canadian military personnel working side by side, protecting North America, I was able to comprehend the integrated nature of the binational NORAD relationship between the two nations. This was something that was only reinforced when I was part of another tour of NORAD years later, uh, the operations center in the Aberhart Finley building. I understand why and how NORAD is an organization, including ex uh, excellent personnel, have the watch. I, I, I was able to get it by being there. And so that's a major theme that I really want to touch upon today. To emphasize that NORAD is a vital Canada-US partnership, that it's unique, 
And it's strengthened by the fact that it is a binational command partnership. Although NORAD is a bilateral agreement between the governments of Canada and the United States, as a military organization, it is a binational command. And binational goes further than bilateral. In the case of NORAD, in that it is a centralized unified command um, that has integrated headquarters in Colorado Springs, consisting of military personnel from both Canada and the United States who work together side by side to keep the watch. The binational nature, nature of NORAD entails having the military forces of uh, two countries integrated into mutual defense and um, in, in looking after each nation's sovereign territory in partnership with each other. NORAD is therefore a recognition of that special relationship between Canada and the United States when it comes to shared responsibility uh, for continental defense from which Canada accrues certain advantages. These include protection from four Canadian citizens, territory and airspace, access to superior and in American intelligence resources, having the ear of the world's most powerful country, but also opportunities for Canadian personnel. Indeed, the binational character of NORAD has also resulted in recognition that an integrated headquarters consisting of cohesive teams of Canadian and American military personnel are needed to ensure effective and efficient defense of North America. So reflecting on the importance of the human element, there's also a high level of trust and mutual respect among the Canadians and Americans and in order military personnel. Emphasizing positive professional interactions and cordial working relationships between like-minded people in NORAD has promoted close bonds between personnel and encourage the common views and uh, on continental air defense since the early Cold War that has enhanced NORAD integration and thus strengthened its binational characteristics. These binational characteristics of NORAD are also represented by its structure when it was first stood up and contains many enduring similarities to today. NORAD has always been twinned with the American Combatant Command, which today is US NORTHCOM. The four-star American um, military commander of NORAD is also double-headed as the commander of U.S. NORTHCOM. But this commander has historically always ensured to understand the uniqueness and the importance of the binational character of NORAD. Perhaps the most vital aspect of the NORAD structure from the Canadian viewpoint and representative of its binational character is the position of the deputy commander, which has always been held by a Canadian three-star Air Force officer. The first officer to hold this position was Air Marshal Roy Slemon, who's actually buried in Colorado Springs, who joined the NORAD Commander General Early Partridge in Colorado Springs in September of 1957. One of the key provisions of the original NORAD terms of reference was that when the commander was away, it was the deputy commander who was in charge, who exercised NORAD operational control in their absence. This clear understanding of the relationship between the NORAD commander and their deputy, especially when the former was absent from the headquarters, was essential for NORAD's success. It's an understanding that can, has continued with success of NORAD commanders and their deputies to this day. Another feature of the binational characteristic of NORAD is that from the very beginning, the Americans embodied in the way General Partridge established his headquarters went out of their way to ensure Canadian involvement in NORAD as equal partners. Air Marshal Slemon's recollections are illustrative. He said, although we're a little partner making relatively small contribution to the operational capability of the joint effort, our views were considered in exactly the same light as our partners, the Americans. Importantly, in setting up the organization of the NORAD headquarters, in consultation with Slemon, General Partridge earmarked key positions in NORAD's organizational structure and staff for Canadians. Indeed, this practice of having Canadian officers in some of the most important positions in NORAD continues today to the great advantage of Canada's military in general and the Royal Canadian Air Force in particular. Perhaps most importantly, Partridge appointed an RCF two-star as the Director of Combat Operations at NORAD headquarters, former RCF Staff College Commandant Air Vice Marshal Keith Hodson. Slemon considered the Director of Combat Operations position the guts of our joint effort. 
and a Canadian officer has subsequently held this position in Colorado Springs since that day. Indeed, this provision places of places of importance of, in NORAD in Colorado Springs continues today, not only in Colorado Springs itself, but also the binational integrated regional component headquarters in Alaska and Florida, where Canadians are also deputy commanders there. And Canada has reciprocated with important positions for Americans in the Canadian NORAD regional headquarters in Winnipeg, this, which also includes a deputy commander position. The binational structure and characteristics of NORAD therefore have given Canada what Joel Sokolsky and Joe Jocko have termed a seat at the console at NORAD where Canadian officers functionally ensure Canadian sovereignty while at the same time fulfill an important operational role in the defense of the continent. It has thus given them a functional front row seat and key positions at NORAD during some of the most dangerous crises, such as the Cuban Missile Crisis, the war scare due to the 1973 Arab-Israeli War, and of course, 9-11, to name only a few. And today, they continue to keep the watch against growing emergent threats from peer adversaries. So, to, to talk about the future of NORAD. I really don't have that much to say on the future of NORAD as a historian, but especially since Andrew Sharon and Jim Ferguson cover the topic very well in their excellent book, NORAD in Perpetuity and Beyond, which I highly uh, endorse. However, I would like to highlight three things. First, NORAD modernization is of course a welcome development. While I do have concerns regarding how it will impact the commander of one Canadian Air Division, who is also the commander of the Canadian NORAD region, and it is in fact quadruple hatted. The proposed update to the Combined Air Operations Center, or CAOC, in Winnipeg will hopefully help with this situation. Second, although some tend to make light of it, don't underestimate the NORAD track Santa role. It warms the heart of children at Chris on Christmas Eve to see where Santa is in the world, and it allows NORAD to provide an important public service in addition to its important role of safeguarding North America. Lastly, Research on NORAD and especially its history is a growth area. Joseph Jocko's book on its first 50 years is, was excellent and Lance Blythe and the rest of the NORAD history office have done some great work. But there are so many other subjects within NORAD 65 years that deserve to be explored. In fact, there are many NORAD arch archival documents that still have yet to be examined. So if you are a researcher interested in studying a fascinating and important topic, NORAD is definitely one to consider. Thank you. Thank you so much for your comments. Um, so interesting. I feel like I have already so many questions, but uh, let's turn to our next speaker, Nicholas Glesby. All right, thanks, Gabriella. And I'm just gonna share my screen here, which is not what I'm doing at the moment. All right, can everyone see the slides now? Thumbs up, maybe? Thumbs up, thanks, Wendy. All right, um, okay, thanks, Nicole. Thanks, Dr. Lachenbauer. Thanks, Dr. Dean, for the invitation uh, to present and speak today at the Emerging Ideas series. I thought it would be best to provide kind of a 40,000 foot overview of NORAD's past, present, and future. And it's really a reflection of uh, my visit to Colorado Springs last week. So even though we're celebrating NORAD's 65th anniversary, I want to begin all the way back in 1938. While in Kingston to receive an honorary degree at Queens and dedicate the Thousand Islands Bridge, Franklin Roosevelt made an extraordinary pledge. The US would not stand idly by if Canada was threatened by any other great power. Responding two days later, Mackenzie King stated that Canada has its obligations as a good and friendly neighbor, that should the occasion ever arise, enemy forces should not be able to pursue their way either by land, sea, or air to the United States across Canadian territory. These statements, termed by historian Beattie and political scientist Hagland as the Kingston Dispensation and the Canadian Corollary, led to the more expansive Ogdensburg Agreement two years later, which created the Permanent Joint Board on Defense, or PJBD. The PJBD is a civilian co-chaired defense advisory board 
that makes recommendations on mutual continental defense issues to the president and to the prime minister. Its broad mandate includes considering the defense of the north half of the Western Hemisphere. So the Kingston Dispensation, the Canadian Corollary, and the Ogdensburg Agreement are the foundation of the Canada-US defense relationship. And the PJBD was paramount during World War II and advised on the defense of Newfoundland and Alaska, among other issues. The post-war order was upended in 1950 when the Soviets detonated a nuclear weapon, the communists took control of mainland China, and the Korean War began, which partially resembles today's great power competition environment. The PJBD's activity resumed in 1951 with a priority on integrating Canadian and American air defenses, as the services now began to view North American airspace as indivisible. The PJBD was very busy in 1951, Recommendation 51.1 advised on the extension of the Pine Tree Line radar system. 51.3 discussed combined air training exercises. 51.4 gave the US limited ability to shoot down hostile aircraft in Canadian airspace, but with the caveat that as long as the aircraft was headed towards the United States. 51.6 agreed on mutual wartime reinforcement of each air force. But 53.1 is perhaps the most important PJBD recommendation. It outlined that aircraft controlled by either the US or Canadian air defenses in peacetime could fly over either country to intercept aircraft. This meant that US pilots could operate in Canada and Canadian pilots could operate in the US and they would be treated as national force assets. And with the benefit of hindsight, 53-1 was most important to the defense relationship overall and is perhaps the PJBD's most consequential recommendation that they made. The recommendation supports the binational view of an indivisible North American airspace with Canadians and Americans operating across boundaries regardless of nationality, with the solution ultimately arriving at a binational command and control joint institution responsible for integrated continental air defense. And as both Dr. J.J. Jockel and Dr. Goet comprehensively explain, the increasing integration driven largely by the air forces of both states' air defense systems eventually results in the operationalization of the Binational North American Air, later Aerospace Defense Command, on September 12, 1957, and by diplomatic exchange of notes on May 12, 1958. So NORAD today is organized into three regions, Alaska region at Joint Base Elmendorf Richardson in Anchorage, Canadian region here at 17 Wing in Winnipeg, Continental region at Tyndall Air Force Base in Panama City, Florida, and is supported by air defense sectors in Washington, in New York, at 22 Wing North Bay in Ontario, and at Elmendorf Richardson. The commander is always a four-star US general, mainly Air Force, but there have been commanders from the Army and the Navy. And the deputy is a Canadian three Maple Leaf Air Force Lieutenant General. The NORAD commander also serves as a dual hat of commander of US Northern Command, the US Geographic Combatant Command responsible for North America. General Van Herk is rotating out of the command uh, position shortly, which opens up the question of the selection of his replacement as a signal to our adversaries, especially from someone if someone from European command was to shift to that role or perhaps a member of the Coast Guard. And to borrow from Dr. Ferguson, NORAD serves as the institutional centerpiece of the Canada-US defense relationship. It also serves as an example of the theory of binationalism a joint institution that cooperates with principles of parity and equality that supersede national interests. Binationalism has not only benefited the defense relationship through NORAD and the Permanent Joint Board on Defense, but also through examples outside of defense, such as the International Joint Commission, which monitors joint Canada-US waterway management. But the best example of binationalism is perhaps RCAF Lieutenant General Eric Finley's decision to close US airspace on September 11, 2001, in his capacity as NORAD Director of Operations in Cheyenne Mountain. And the current NORAD modernization cycle has tremendous potential to bring jobs and economic resources, training and education to the Arctic, dual purpose investment in infrastructure like communication systems, water systems and energy and electricity are all new energy and electricity systems are all desperately needed. And it would be needed to sustain workers maintaining new radar lines. There is also opportunity space to repair some trust with these communities with the environmental damage of the dew line created. 
This modernization cycle includes six new radar lines. The Polar and Arctic have already been announced for Canada, with the first to be built in Southern Ontario. The acquisition of F-35s and machine learning, artificial intelligence, and cloud computing, which supports Commander Van Herc's decision superiority doctrine, a pan-domain awareness from seabed to space. But this raises the question of US Cyber Command's role in NORAD modernization, as NORTHCOM and NORAD have no cyber mandate for beyond protection of its own computer systems. And again, this raises strategic questions of the function of the US combatant commands relative to today's great power competition. So NORAD has adapted, evolved, and reorganized over its history as adversaries' weapons technology has developed and the threats to North America have changed. And as Dr. Jockel says, NORAD has always been twinned to varying degrees with a separate U.S. military institution that serves U.S. national interests. First, it was Continental Air Defense, then Aerospace Defense Command, Strategic Air Command, Space Command, and now Northern Command. Given this all new, uh, new all domain threat environment is not fixed to the traditional, mainly Arctic avenues of approach, are Mexico, Greenland, Iceland, etc., being sufficiently accounted for in integrated command and control? Is the current tri command framework of NORAD, NORTHCOM, and Canadian Joint Operations Command still the best way to organize North American defense? In the United States, are geographic combatant commands still the best way to ensure deterrence by denial to protect North America? And NORAD, like Dr. Schron says, has a global area of operations, but can only operate in the air and partially in the maritime domains. And this doesn't even consider the missile defense issue in Canada. So large questions are there. But NORAD acts as a symbol of stability in the Canada-US relationship beyond defense, especially during trade and economic disagreements. But it flies under the political radar so much that when in times of relative global stability, like before 9-11, technically complex capability upgrade requests by the military are often ignored within the, within the defense procurement processes and in elite political circles. It is only when crises like September 11th or Ukraine demand everyone's attention, do these investments follow? And can Canada sustain its promised investment regardless of high level politics or changes in government? So most Americans and Canadians have little awareness of the binational command beyond Nora attract Santa. After the February Chinese spy balloon incident, when many questioned why an American fighter could legally intercept an object over the Yukon, Hyperpartisanship and misunderstanding threaten to divide public support, and it plays directly into our adversaries' objectives of a divided continent. Greater public standing, understanding of what NORAD is designed to do and does creates confidence in the institutions that protect us. Dividing North Americans into political camps when it comes to conversations over our defense institutions lends itself to the disinformation game that our adversaries actively attempt to exploit. But does greater public awareness of what NORAD does disable its ability to fly under the political radar? Is it helpful for NORAD? Does it help NORAD achieve its modernization needs? And furthermore, like Dr. Goet uh, mentioned, the transfer of institutional knowledge from renowned and established scholars to new and emerging scholars seems to be especially limited as strategic studies programs or military history offerings uh, are not plentiful available in Canada, let alone there are only four Canadian books on NORAD. And three of the authors are on this panel. But the best form to handle these politically sensitive conversations and technically complex issues are the PJBD and its military twin, the Military Cooperation Committee. The activity of these forms peak and valley given the geopolitical environment, but are best kept a secret and away from the public spotlight because relative to the day jobs in government or in the services uh, that the board members come from, these issues can be expedited to the executive branch for attention when it matters most. These frank discussions that happen without media attention are beneficial to finding compromise and solution. And that's why regular meetings combined with Ottawa and Washington's equal support of the PJBD in particular to study, advise, and recommend on complicated defense issues of the day is key to ensure binationalism continues to be a success that our joint institutions remain above the fray of partisanship. And in the next 65 years, I think and I hope 
that NORAD will continue to be responsible for their airspace control, airspace warning, maritime warning, the continental US and Canada, and will continue to have the watch. Thank you. Thanks so much, Nick. Um, it's really interesting comments. Now let's turn to Dr. Sharon. Well, thanks very much. Uh, first, I want to thank the North American, North, North American and Arctic Defense Security Network um, for hosting this and for really being an opportunity for many students and research fellows to um, uh, to, to dig into some of the issues affecting both or the Arctic and continental defense uh, and being a showcase for our important research. Um, what I'm going to be doing is talking about sort of the, the, the present day NORAD and some of the challenges it has. And then Jim is going to follow with sort of the future for NORAD. But um, before I do that, I want to take advantage of the fact that Richard Goet is here, and I know he has to sign off. Uh, we wrote our book as a triptych. Um, Richard Goet's excellent, excellent book, Sovereignty and Command in the Canada-U.S. Continental uh, Defense between 1940 and 57, really was the foundation for how is it that Canada and the U.S. got to this point that they would be considering a binational command. And then Joseph Jockel's book on uh, Canada in NORAD looks from 1957 when NORAD was operational. So as JJ says, um, the fact that NORAD is celebrating its 65th anniversary is really a bit of a lie because it was up and operational in 1957. So we're all behind by a year. But he reflected out until 2007, uh, when by that point we had U.S. NORTHCOM, it was twinned with NORAD, the, the agreement was signed in quote-unquote perpetuity, and it, uh, NORAD was given a new mission, so in addition to aerospace uh, warning and control, it was given a maritime warning uh, mission. But I was going to take advantage of the fact that Richard is here and ask him, um, because he is a command and control specialist, the way that um, NORAD is sort of the foundation of it is this idea that U.S. NORTHCOM and NORAD are twinned, and it has a deep connection to CJOC, the Canadian Joint Operations Command. However, the Canadian NORAD Regional Headquarters, which is located here in Winnipeg, uh, is at, you know, not only arm's length, but physical length uh, from the CJOC. And so I was hoping Richard might um, be able to give us some insights about that tri-command relationship and going into the future, what might need, we need to look at in order to quote unquote modernize NORAD? Thanks, Andrea. I'll be I'll be uh, brief, um, and especially because you and Jim are, are really the the experts on the, on the whole tri command structure um, aspect. But I, I think it's going to be interesting, and, and and you talk best about it in, in your book about what the future might be for NORAD. Is it going to evolve into a broader, you know, cross domain continental defense organization that's been proposed in the in the past, especially after 9/11 and 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 things like that and and so it's uh it, it can be somewhat difficult to have that um relationship because when it comes to um continental defense um there's also aspects of defending canada but also the the strong part of, of, of canada and that there's a lot of um domestic operations that go on uh that that relate to that and we saw a lot of that during uh, the pandemic we see it every year uh, with some of the climate change related um issues um, as well. And so there's good cooperation there. Um, could there be a bit of enhancements? Yes, but Canadians and Americans do things a little bit different with the American National Guard, uh, with certain limitations on Canada's role of the military um, in domestic operations, and in particular how it's the provinces have to request from uh, to the federal government to, to send in Canadian armed forces. So there's some different command, there's military command and control, but there's also command and control related to different levels of, of, of governments and 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 things like that. And in, in all honesty, that also relates to what you and Jim talk about in your book about probably some of the difficulties of like cyber coming in because the military has certain areas of cyber, uh, but a lot of it is in um, a lot of other government uh, institutions. Um, and so there's going to be a lot more, there's going to be a lot more coordination on the military side, uh, but also on the 
on the uh, political side. Um, Anessa Kimball wrote a really interesting article last year that looks at Transport Canada, in example, uh, related to NAD Canada in response to uh, the 9-11 um, uh, and all the airplanes landing in Gander and, and so on and, and, and so forth. So um, as it relates to one Canadian Air Division, um, as mentioned, it's quadruple hatted. It's the JFAC for, for Canada. It's the Canadian NORAD region. Um, it's uh, responsible for all air defense or all air, air operations in Canada and also uh, expeditionary operations and, and for the SAR uh, region um, as well. So is that maybe being quadruple hatted a little bit too much with more NORAD? Modernization um, coming on uh, doesn't have the personnel, especially in the age of reconstitution, uh, to be able to uh, to, to handle um, the situation. I don't know, so I'm not sure how much that is going to be explored with uh, with NORAD modernization. Uh, and there is a representative of uh, the, the JFAC in Nor in uh, CJOC headquarters, the uh, the component, the ACE, um, who really does a good job at the colonel level um, to make sure that there's that air awareness, but again, that includes all the air operations of which NORAD Concerns is uh, is a part. So definitely some challenges for the future. Thanks for the opportunity. Yeah, thanks Richard. And Gabriella, I'm just going rogue and I just thought I'd see if there's uh, any more questions for Richard because uh, he, he really is the expert, um, especially on the early days of NORAD. So if anybody has any burning questions uh, because he has to step out, um, Whitney. Rich, not a question that will surprise you. If you had a wish list of, you know, three projects or studies or books that you'd love to see written on NORAD to flesh things out, what might they be? And I'm thinking of some of our students within the network, and you can interpret that however the heck you like. Um, I'll say them, but they might be some from my my own future projects. Who knows? But I would encourage the students to get a start on it as well. Um, the, the role of NORAD during the Cuban Missile Crisis uh, would be a very interesting one. Uh, on the maritime side, there's been some really good work done on it on that lately. There was actually a book just produced this past fall by Mike Whitby from uh, DMV's Director of, of History and Heritage that really um, covers off a lot of the maritime um, aspect. Um, and its maritime focus is there. It's really good for maritime warning aspect of NORAD, but the, the air defense uh, part has been partially told by Peter Hayden, but it needs to be uh, done in full. So I'm sure the official history team um, in Ottawa is working on that as well. Um, uh, a, uh, a study of NORAD and the Arctic specifically that the history um, I think would be really interesting, especially for, um, you know, from an Adson um, uh, perspective, um, that would be, um, you know, very uh, interesting. Um, and also expanding on your own work um, on, on the do line in terms of the roles, uh, the challenges um, like a, a, a long, lengthy um, um, monograph look um, at the dew line, but also the North Warning System as a, I, I guess, uh, a bit of a, uh, a teaser for the NORAD modernization system that's going to be uh, coming up. Thanks. And, and in Rich's marvelous consummate diplomacy, what he's really doing is jabbing me because, dare I say, more than 20 years ago when we first met at Directorate of History and Heritage, I was there researching a history of the dew line that still has not appeared two decades later. So thanks, Rich. For you said that, it, not me. Reminder packet. Great. Well, thanks, Richard. And uh, uh, hopefully we'll be able to pass on to you any questions if they come up later. Um, so I'm going to look at sort of the present day NORAD um, and reflect on how it's evolved, but really the challenges that it faces. And I thought I'd break it up into three different areas. So the first is perils. Um, the next is sort of politics and purse strings. And the third is this idea of the publics and their idea of NORAD. And rather, I'll, I'll start with the perils, but rather than getting into the specifics of sort of itemizing, you know, we have hypersonic weapons, we have drones, which NORAD calls the low and slow problem. Um, I want to look at sort of four realities that NORAD is, is always juggling, uh, that, that is a persistent, are persistent issues in the background that they have to deal with. And the first is that NORAD is what we call both a supporting and a supported command. That means that 
NORAD is not a force generator. It cannot produce its own personnel and it can't produce its own capabilities. And so it's really reliant on both the US and Canadian militaries to chop over what we call a change of operational control, change it over to give personnel to NORAD, um, earmark, for example, CF-18s for NORAD service, and so, of course, if there are any national priorities uh, that are affecting Canada and the U.S., those promises can be pulled back. And so NORAD can't sort of generate uh, its own personnel and capabilities. And of course, the, the second sort of challenge is that both the U.S. and Canada are really suffering from uh, readiness reconstitution challenges and they're also both trying to modernize not only uh, technologies capabilities but also their approach to how best to defend what Canada calls uh, continental defense and what the Americans tend to refer to as homeland defense. Indeed, when we're talking about NORAD, uh, Jim and I often found we needed a Canada-US translation guide uh, because the languages that both governments speak is, is slightly different. The third challenge for NORAD is that uh, its attention has shifted and it is usually a product of two things, sort of the crisis of the moment, what are both countries sort of hyper fixated on at the time, and of course the capabilities they have at the time to deal with that. And so we see that, you know, NORAD was always outward facing in its early days, of course, was, was most interested in the Arctic approaches and of course the Soviet bear bombers over time that changed, but it was always sort of an outward facing uh, concern. What are the threats coming into North America? When the Soviet Union disappeared, uh, NORAD, similar to NATO, was sort of wondering, well, what will be our next reincarnation? But both had a momentum that nobody, I think, ever really thought that they would disappear. Nevertheless, NORAD had to think about what it was going to do next. And many people don't realize that it was instrumental in assisting with at least the air surveillance side of uh, the drug interdiction mission that was, was led by the US. We hit 9-11 and we realized all of a sudden that NORAD's focus outwards for threats coming into North America left it sort of uh, blind to what was happening within North America. And we then see NORAD sort of shifting to pay more attention into North America. Uh, we see the creation of this new operation called Operation Noble Eagle, which sets up sort of no-fly zones in key over key cities, especially where the president is within North America. And then for major events like the Super Bowl, uh, G7s, Winter Olympics, so that uh, NORAD can assist with that uh, air warning and control aspect. It was also NORAD's um, shift to focusing on what was the key concern post 9-11 for both Canada and the US, which was terrorism and especially a particular form of terrorism, a Sunni based form of terrorism. And so when you would go to the NORAD headquarters, you were introduced to what was called this subway map because it looked like a metro map. But it was sort of a timeline of all the key uh, major attacks on North America from these forms of terrorism. And while we were all focused on that, we were perhaps not watching or seeing the rise of China and uh, Russia. And so today we have Russia is quoted as the persistent proximate threat to North America because of its capabilities and its and its geographic location. And then China becomes the pacing threat um, very much uh, globally and specifically for the US. The other sort of perils factor that NORAD has to consider is that both Canada and the US have consistently thought that the best way to protect North America was really to deploy troops and capabilities overseas and to meet the threat as far away from North America as possible. 
And so that uh, compunction to orient away from North America and to problems that are located elsewhere means that uh, NORAD has had a really tough time, I think, convincing governments that they need uh, capabilities, funding, attention on a persistent basis. The next thing I want to turn to is sort of the politics and the purse strings. And certainly Nicholas Glesby did a great job of sort of um, hinting at the fact that NORAD has consistently flown, excuse the pun, sort of under the political radar. Richard Goet does a great job of showing um, it was a functional solution to create this thing called NORAD. It was the experience of both Canada and the U.S. in World War II and their uh, air forces working together, that they realized that in a Cold War context, they had to consider the airspace sort of indivisible. And therefore, what they needed was technical solution to this common problem, which was to consider that the airspace was in fact indivisible and that they should work together. Because it's such a technical process and you quickly, when talking about NORAD, have to talk about things like command and control and chopping over capabilities, et cetera, et cetera, that the, the politicians lose interest and focus rather quickly. They understand that NORAD is um, uh, sort of run by the military um, and they're best left to sort of do what they do best. And the politicians only get involved when there's a question of either agreements, which used to have to be renegotiated every sort of five years, or if there was a uh, particular capital funding that had to go into the NORAD command. So that in addition to this Western way of war, which is always sort of oriented uh, away from North America, means that NORAD has struggled to get that persistent funding and attention. We all sort of um, peak curiosity around Christmas time when NORAD talks about tracking Santa. And of course, whenever there are relationship difficulties between Canada and the U.S., um, think about the difficulty we had renegotiating uh, the NAFTA agreement. Of course, we all reflexively turn to NORAD as sort of a, a confirmation that all is right with the Canada-US uh, relationship. But nevertheless, in this new uh, geopolitical world and the changing technology that we have, NORAD needs consistent, persistent uh, attention and funding. Um, one of the things we discovered from the 9-11 um, review was that, you know, NORAD had been saying for a long time they needed to be able to have direct feeds into the NORAD um, operations center so that they could see what the Federal Aviation Administration and NAV Canada were seeing rather than sort of it being relayed when there was a problem. Um, computers needed updating and a recognition that increasingly a lot of the information that NORAD needs, notwithstanding the fact that they only have, you know, 1.5 domains of concern, sort of the aerospace and maritime warning, a lot of the information and intelligence they need is housed by other government departments and even other allies. So it's been a slow process for, I think, uh, both Canada and the US. How do we integrate this extra information and intelligence so that we keep um, important information secret or classified, especially if we're talking about a support to law enforcement case? We don't want to prejudice any future prosecutions. Um, um, but at the same time, dealing with a behemoth like the U.S., which often tends to overclassify information. And so it feels a bit like they're a big vacuum um, cleaner. They're sucking up all this intelligence and information, especially from other allies and trying to get it from other government departments. But then being able to access that information, even your own information that you've passed along, if it's been classified as, you know, no foreign, uh, becomes a, a consistent struggle. 
And that's not one that politicians generally want to weigh into. It is up to the technocrats to sort that out. Finally, I want to turn to both the Canadian and U.S. publics, and it always astounds me how little um, both the Canadian and U.S. publics understand and know of NORAD. I think it's generally better in Canada. Uh, in the U.S., when we were in Colorado Springs, you know, if you randomly stopped people and said, we're here for NORAD 65th, they sort of looked at you blankly like, what are you talking about? So NORAD is really, I think, a combatant command because it has a four-star general as the head, and that seems to be one of the key criteria to have a U.S. combatant command um, designation. But what's really special about NORAD is it has a global area of operations as opposed to a discrete area of responsibility, which the other U.S. combatant commands have. And so if you talk to Americans about Indo-PACOM or, or U.S. NORTHCOM, they have a little bit more understanding what that is. But in Canada, of course, we have this thing called the Canadian Joint Operations Command, which is not only Canada wide, but also responsible for operations overseas that are not Special Forces or NORAD. Uh, and we have this really funky tri command relationship. So it's really hard for people to get their heads around it. But it was made, I think, most clear when we had that Chinese spy balloon, which was shot down on February 4th in 2023. The Secretary of Defense, Lloyd Austin, uh, released a statement on February 4th that in essence said that the spy balloon was shot down by a U.S. NORTHCOM asset, which I find interesting because it's really not the purview of U.S. NORTHCOM, and then thanked Canada and NORAD for their uh, role in detecting and warning of the spy balloon, which kind of circumscribes what it is that NORAD in Canada did in relation to the tracking of this and several other balloons. But what was most interesting was how quickly media and conversations in the U.S. and in Canada turned to accuse the other of malfeasance. So in the case of Canada, I think a lot of people were surprised, shocked, wondering why it was an F-22 Raptor might have been involved in uh, shooting down a balloon in Canadian airspace. You know, how dare the Americans be in our airspace? And on the American side, I think it came as a great uh, shock to them that anybody but Americans were responsible for sort of the the, the warning and defense of uh, the continental United States. And I think that's what we're going to need more attention to. We know in Canada, it's very difficult to get the Canadian public to be interested in defense issues in Canada. With what modernization entails in the future and this um, drive by the U.S. military to achieve all domain command and control, which really does require all militaries and even other government departments and allies to start to integrate their efforts and information, um, not understanding the roles and functions of NORAD is going to make it even harder for politicians uh, to weigh in because they're always going to have to deal with the misunderstandings and misinformations of their own Canadian publics and US publics first before they can even get to um, the discussions about how to modernize. And here I'll turn it over to my colleague, James. We're on, there we go, we're on. Thanks, Andrea. Thanks, Gabriella and the network, et cetera. So my sort of task is, and I'm gonna be fairly brief, I think, because uh, we can get into more details as we go along, is to talk about the future of NORAD. Uh, and many of the issues that confront NORAD, if you put it under the umbrella of modernization, uh, have already been raised by Nick and Andrea and Richard. Uh, so we can go into more details down the road, but let me begin with this, and again, it's always difficult to predict the future. We all know that. Uh, let me give, be, begin by paraphrasing the old English saying, there will always be a NORAD. 
Why? Uh, well, Richard raised it very clearly and it's been raised that for simply at a minimum, and there's a lot of reasons, but at a minimum, NORAD is, at a, is the symbolic institutional centerpiece of the Canada-US defense relationship in North America. And I would suggest to you that it's more than just the North American. It's a centerpiece institutionally of the Canada-US defense relationship writ large even though people don't usually make a broader connection from NORAD. And it's difficult, if not near impossible, to imagine under what conditions, what catastrophe would lead NORAD to collapse, would lead both parties to walk away. Um, it, it's just almost impossible to imagine why uh, that would occur. Uh, so NORAD's not going to go away. The real issue for the future is what will NORAD do in the future? Uh, and you can start here with what we call a minimalist and maximalist uh, options. The minim middle minimalist option is that NORAD will stay in its box. It will remain responsible for aerospace warding, the missions it already does, both in terms of air and ballistic missile threats and its space tracking mission, uh, aerospace control, which is really simply air defense and looks live, stay in the atmosphere and won't go any further in terms of a defense mission or a sharp end mission. And maritime warning will continue to rumble along as it is. The maximalist option or where it may go instead is as Rumsfeld suggested back in the wake of 9-11, that it will morph into an integrated North American Defense Command, where all the domains, air, land, sea, as well as space, and cyber is a little different, and I'll put that aside, will become integrated into a single binational command. And between those two poles, if you will, or those two options. Uh, of course, there's lots of different variants that one can conceptualize about where it go. And I'll talk about where I think it will go, or at least to get hints of where it's headed. Uh, and also in the context of all this, it's important, and I'm not gonna go and talk to a lot about them right now, uh, that there are obstacles everywhere uh, for this. But I think one of the key ways to imagine this, where NORAD will go, and the minimalist one is a dangerous one because of technological changes that are occurring in terms of integration of all domain awareness, all domain command control, and how then do you sort of leave NORAD sitting at the margin? How relevant does it really become? So the institution may stay, but it may become increasingly drift into irrelevance. And that has other implications. I think Richard hinted at some of them relative to Canadian interests, as well as American interest in uh, expanding, integrating, and developing the relationship further. So one way to understand this is to look at the conditions that brought NORAD into being in the 1950s and compare them and comparisons, historical comparisons, always problematic, I understand, to the conditions that exist today. So let me outline three or four of them. First of all, technological transformation or technological change, however you wanna talk about it. Uh, in the 50s, coming out of World War II, the experience of strategic, the strategic bombing campaigns in World War II, the expectation that this would be copied. Uh, North America for the first time faced a major new threat environment from the air. The idea of a sanctuary or separate, uh, protected by three oceans sort of collapsed. And with the Soviet development of long range aviation and nuclear weapons married to them, you now had a significant defense problem which would then drive the need to how to manage this effectively and efficiently uh, between Canada and the United States married at the hip, not just for values and political reasons, but simply for geopolitical reasons, for geographic reasons. If we track to today and look at that technological change and it's, it was mentioned by Andrea, we're in the same situation. We have a new generation of technologies, not simply longer and longer range air and sea launch cruise missiles, which under the current conditions, Canadian and American capabilities to deal with them have changed dramatically from the, from the period of the development of NORAD in the 50s. 
But you also have the development of hypersonic vehicles, which blur the distinction that long enabled Canada to stay out of missile defense, that there was air and there was space ballistic missiles, two separate things. Hypersonics reside on the margins of both or blur this and how will we then react to it? So that's another new technological requirement, which of course requires new surveillance capabilities and sensors, uh, the North Warning System, the ground-based radars as they exist right now, as many studies have shown, can't deal with the hypersonic problem, nor is the American Ballistic Missile Early Warning Network geared to deal with that problem. So you have this issue sitting out there. We have a new technological world. And in some ways, it's similar, one can argue, to that world of the 50s that brought NORAD into, be into being. The second, of course, is the political environment, or this international environment. As you know, 50s, we have the Cold War, deep hostility and adversarial relationship between the United States and the Soviet Union, driven by a lot of factors, which is an important environment which could drive the importance of defense forward in North America and cooperation. And today we have a similar environment with, as Andrea mentioned, with the Russian problem and the Chinese problem. And these two then feed into another interesting comparative phenomena. That comparative phenomena is simply that in the 50s, you go back, notwithstanding McCarthy and the witch hunts, there was by and large a bipartisan consensus about the need to confront and deter the Soviet Union. There was no great internal political fight in the United States, nor was there in Canada. We agreed we saw the world as the Americans saw the world and vice versa. So you didn't have that political problem uh, that of course would sort of raise its ugly head after the agreement was signed uh, when the sovereignty issue got raised in Canada. But nonetheless, uh, there remained that consensus and it would change in the 60s and it would be a part of a factor which would sort of freeze NORAD relative to technology. Uh, but if you track to today, one of the interesting phenomena today in the context of the Russian invasion of Ukraine and as well in terms of the, the growing discourse around the China question in Canada, it's been there as in priority in the United States for a long time, but in Canada as a function of a variety of factors we all know about, uh, you now have strangely a tripartisan consensus. You see no major attacks on the government by the opposition parties over defense spending, particularly not in terms of we're going to spend too much and other issues that have always been underneath the surface of the Canada-US defense relationship and Canada-US relations uh, writ large. So you have now two at the same time from the past to the present, two very conducive political elements uh, which are driving forward or making it more difficult or to use the phrase that uh, NORAD people always like to use, uh, a better or greater ability or understanding of an expansive mission suite for NORAD because the political traffic will now bear it as the political traffic bore it in the 1950s. So if you look at those elements, what one would suggest is what this means is that the very functional logic and central to Andrew and my book at the end and throughout it is that this was driven by a bunch of functional logic. You have, of course, another interesting feature. Uh, and that is what Joel Sikorsky calls the fraternity of the brotherhood of the uniform. Air Force, Air Force, talking similar languages, understanding each other, which of course has been deep for a broad time, which is now expanded in NORAD to, to a lesser degree, but still has expanded uh, at the naval side with maritime warning, with the involvement at least directly with uh, US civil agencies such as the Coast Guard and other civil agencies through NORTHCOM uh, that has expanded this idea of a fraternity that is itself broadening out. It's, it still remains dominated as an aerospace institution, but it's not that really that anymore. And witness, for example, the presence of uh, two naval commanders and one army commander of NORAD. Uh, and of, although on the Canadian side, we've maintained as an Air Force only, someday in the future, the, we aren't gonna get an Air Force officer. 
we might get a naval or a land officer. So if you look at those elements, it seems to me that a lot of the same basic features are in place, which are supportive of an expanding NORAD mission suite. And into the context of this, you put in one other thing. Uh, by and large, because of the in inequality in the relationship, the nature of the relation between a superpower and a lesser power like Canada, uh, in terms of capabilities, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, uh, by and large, the U.S. has always been the driver. Canada, by and large, reacts to American initiatives. Uh, and as the Americans push, and it doesn't mean they dictate to us, because one of the values of NORAD and the broader bilateral relationship, which is extremely deep and broad between Canada and the United States, which is another factor that's going to support, I think, uh, mission expansion uh, down the road. Uh, if those are the opportunities we try to influence the Americans in terms of where they think they're going. And we sort of have these chances to say, well, wait a minute, you better think about what we think about this. And these are other forces at play. And then when you look at where the American are going, issues about the unified command plan, all domain awareness, all domain command and control. This is, was dropped by Van Herk, but it was his predecessor, predecessor talked about it. And you have this talking about this at the global level with the US global information exercises going on, which is about all domain awareness and linking the regional commands of the unified command plan. You have all these forces at play. And one of the great things of NORAD is we get to be there. We're the only ally playing in this and we don't play much, but we get to know what they're up to. And if this is the process that's of integration, the Americans, then this is going to spill over into the relationship with Canada because Canada will have to respond to this. And when you put it together, what, it get, what you get then is a slow, like if you think from uh, the end of World War II, the beginnings of the identification, as Nick pointed out, of the air defense, common air defense problem within a common threat environment, a 10 year, 12 year process before NORAD pops up uh, out of the blue in many ways, at least at the public level and the political level, uh, you can think about, well, this is how it's going to start to play out. And it's, it seems clear to me, the first thing that's gonna to start to move forward is the issue of, and <clears throat> people have mentioned Greenland and Iceland and expanding NORAD. <clears throat> Denmark is now engaged down in Colorado Springs. <clears throat> <clears throat> so that's going to be the interesting phenomenon to see how that plays itself out. Canada has been dead silent about it, but they know it's on the table right now. But the key thing is the likelihood that they're going to have to have to move into the world of maritime control. Uh, the, the capabilities, the, and Richard mentioned in the, responding to Whitney <clears throat> about the role of the Navy and the Cuban Missile Crisis, the principles right now that naval forces can be chopped over to NORAD command as it was they could do in the Cold War as a aircraft carrier was chopped over to NORAD command uh, off New York in 9-11. Given one of the elements of technology, military technology, the shrinking of time and space, one does not have time and space for this anymore. It's too quick. If you're going to truly have decision superiority, you need to have this much more fixed and the NORAD model is the model that has worked, been successful. So it seems to me at the end of the day, I'm gonna end here is that when you look about modernization and generally we talk about NORAD modernization, you know, new radar lines, uh, new uh, uh, fighters, et cetera, new command and control capabilities with this artificial intelligence, the Pathfinder initiative, initiative coming out of the United States. Uh, when you look at that centered upon NORAD modernization, rea in reality, if you go back to the actual documents, what have been said, whether it's in the communiques between President Trump and Prime Minister Trudeau 2017, or more recently between Prime Minister Trudeau and Pre President Biden, strong, secure, and engaged, there is a thing called North American defense modernization. And that we don't talk about very much, but North American defense modernization is about modernizing the entire relationship. And with that, the NORAD model is one that's gonna be pushed forward, it seems to me. And the maritime control would become the key element that is likely that is going to start to move it. 
there will be naturally major barriers between among the services, the jealous guarding of their independence of the navies, which have a long historical link. Uh, there'll be political issues potentially that will emerge that will slow it down. There's a variety of factors that are going to slow it, but I think there's an air of inevitability. The world has changed. NORAD as it's now exists, even with modernization, remains notwithstanding maritime warning in its Cold War box, and that's no longer functionally efficient or effective for the joint defense of an ind indivisible landmass, and that landmass is North America. So I'll end there. Thanks very much. So thank you everyone to our speakers. Thank you, Dr. Ferguson as well. Really great comments from everyone. Um, I feel like as moderator, I have the right to ask the first question. Um, <laughs> so I'll ask Andrea, um, you talked about this interesting balance between NORAD operates really well because it can fly under the radar in some aspects and kind of stay away from hyperpolarization. But you know, there's still that need for persistent funding and attention to really achieve things. So I was just wondering if you could speak to that balance and if there is a happy medium ground to find. Well, you know, I have a, a real sympathy for politicians today because it's it's not like during the Cold War where there was a single adversary. Everybody was um, clear about the threat. Uh, we had, and we get this from Nicholas's presentation, we had an active permanent joint board of defense that had the ear of both the president and the prime minister and a military cooperation committee that was providing advice and decisions could be made. Um, they tended to be nonpartisan decisions. It was all about the defense of North America. Today, we're in a very different world. Um, it's technologically far more complicated. It's not clear where the threats um, are. And of course, Washington and Ottawa have a different perspective on the threats on which to, to um, uh, pay attention to as opposed to what NORAD's uh, mandate is. There is now, you know, I would say hyper partisanship more and more, especially when it comes to things like defense procurement. And we have a public um, that sort of vacillates in terms of interest and uh, reward for paying attention to defense and security issues. So really, really complicated. Um, and we have at a time when it should be most active, uh, a PJBD that's been really quite marginalized. Um, and I think one of the questions I would ask Nicholas is, do we have the right um, membership in terms of uh, chairs, co-chairs for the PJBD? Because that might also be affecting uh, decisions and, and percolating issues to the top. Do you want me to go or do you want to interject, Gabrielle? No, go ahead. <laughs> um, well, historically, the PJBD co-chair was someone that um, was appointed based off of political expediency or, or favor to the president and the prime minister. I think that the US's uh, new appointment of Assistant Secretary Dalton uh, re-emphasizes what you said about technologically complex uh, threats and, and weapon systems that a technocrat is now in the US co-chair position. And her equal in Canada is not in the Canadian position. So I think that's potentially somewhere that uh, Canada needs to um, maybe place a little more value on. Um, even though Dr. Jockel, for example, says Canada has typically uh, paid more attention to the PJBD than the US has, seems like that's kind of flipped. Any questions from the audience? You're welcome to just um, turn yourself off of mute and turn your camera on. Go ahead, Mihai. Okay, thanks. Um, <clears throat> this question goes uh, for Dr. Ferguson. So you're you're mentioning so basically in line with your overall theme of the future of NORAD. I was wondering if you can be able to comment on how we how we can best pursue uh, regional development initiatives. So. Since NORAD modernization 
also includes research and development initiatives alongside its other um its other how do i say this priorities that it wants to go through um i want to know what your thoughts are about canada engaging with the united states about co-developing anti-hypersonic defense capabilities and if possible could you be able to comment on the benefits and challenges of obtaining some of these capabilities for our own defense There is a largely moribund uh, agreement between Canada and the United States called the, called the Defense Development Sharing Agreement, in which goes back to the early 60s and relates to the, the agreement earlier, which was known as the Defense uh, Production Sharing Arrangement. Uh, the DDSA was basically designed to facilitate what you are mentioning, co-development of weapon systems. There was a ceiling put on the amount of the program each would contribute when they agreed uh, on that to move forward on this. Uh, the problem that's happened is it's never been modernized. So the amount is so minuscule compared to the cost of research and development today for dealing with advanced weapon systems or developing de advanced weapon systems that it really sits there dead. Uh, but it is a tool long forgotten by everyone that you could resurrect uh, as a means to move something like anti-hypersonic capabilities in a joint development. The probability is extremely low for a variety of reasons, however. And it doesn't mean that Canada and the United States uh, are going to sort of go their own way, you know, only in the sense that they've always gone their own way. Uh, so what I mean by that is, if you look at D, uh, DRDC right now and what's on their priority list, and again, we don't get much fidelity uh, in terms of exactly what they're doing. Then you look at what the US is doing, particularly out of DARPA on these things and, and other places, the US being much larger than us, and we've never been very good at investing in defense R&D. Uh, there, there is commonality. So, I wouldn't call it the possibility of a co-development, but they will sort of run on different similar tracks and integrate with them. And this then you have to put in the context of the Canada-US defense industrial and technological relationship. We have to understand the reality of Canada and where Canada sits with the US. You look after the structure of Canada defense industries and technology. Over half of them are American-owned subsidiaries. A larger portion, if you even expand that further, they are connected into the American supply chain process. Uh, you have significant American companies present here. Likelihood, I don't know the answer right now, but the likelihood, for example, uh, of what company is going to get the uh, uh, over the horizon on radar contract, and I don't know if it's been released yet, but I can tell you right now, the company is going to be Raytheon Canada. Uh, and they will draw mostly upon access to advanced technologies coming out of Raytheon in the United States. And you can do this with general dynamics subsidiaries for all, all of these. So there's a joint interest. There's a common interest, which is part of the impact of hypersonics. There's a recognition that something has to be done. Uh, you look at where the, the major players are here. They're really not in Canada. But because of Canada's relevance to all this, and it can't be ignored, uh, that's how Canada ends up being engaged in these things. So as I said, I don't think there's going to be a former co-development program at all, but there will be this interactive that's classic in our relationship with the United States. Andrea, you have your hand up. Yeah, well, I was just going to add, and I, I'm not going to talk about hypersonics um, but when we talk about co-development, we usually think about it in terms of a government to nation to nation, indigenous peoples sort of co-development of projects and spin-offs and effects. And you know, I think what I I, I appreciate is that um, unlike when the dew line was upgraded to the north warning system there's absolutely no consultation with local indigenous peoples and no thought to clean up and the like we're starting to hear the military talk about um being conscious of the multi-purpose multi-need effects 
of especially the infrastructure that sort of undergirds much of the NORAD modernization. Think about the runways, the potential communication systems that will link these systems of systems. Um, and and there, at least floating in the air, is this requirement that maybe rather than simply thinking about defense only needs that we consider um, the needs of communities, but there's a caution there. One, you know, the Department of Defense is not in the business of helping with things like water treatment centers and, you know, uh, strengthening governance systems and ensuring persistent funding for Indigenous uh, um, hamlets. Uh, you know, it's related to dual use uh, infrastructure. On the other hand, I worry that it's, again, you know, a tick in the box. Okay, we've thought about it. We can now move on. Um, and so I'm hoping that there's going to be considered um, interest and um, connections to where the infrastructure is going and, and what, if any, of the possible multi-purpose benefits there can be. And if I could just add something real quick, Dr. Ferguson mentioned the Defense Production Sharing Agreement. And if I could go back to the PJBD, that was actually a recommendation in 1949 that Canada and the US buy military equipment from each other during peacetime, which if I can plug, not only shows the importance of the PJBD historically, but that having this form to sit and think and advise and recommend is important even in peacetime. We have a question for Nick about the PJBD. So given that we've talked a lot about NORAD modernization, um, should the PJBD be modernized? Are there things that should develop or be different from how it was in the past? What, what recommendations or ideas might you have? Well, I think the first thing is, is that it still benefits from being secret. It still benefits from having those frank discussions away from media spotlight or public access because it allows uh, those nitty gritty details to be worked out and it's not political and you have the technocrats doing the work and then it can expedite it for attention to the executive branch. Uh, it's also designed and was formed flexibly so that you know, government officials from Transport Canada or um, throw in the department of the day for the issue of the day, I can't think of it at the moment, can sit on the board and can provide advice and recommendations. Um, and Dr. Sharon and I have spoken about what advice is, and maybe it's not a formal recommendation, but it is, um, you know, a document of ideas, or it is just the ability to say, hey, this issue has come up, it's been placed on the agenda internally or by a member of the board that represents a service or a government department. And it, it goes to the executive branch and says, this is a pressing issue, or this is a issue in the short term or long term that needs to be addressed or needs to be at least thought of. Thank you. We also have a question about um, something that we've talked a little bit about today. So the potentially expanding of NORAD to include other countries. So Denmark Green, Denmark and Greenland, Mexico, Iceland. Um, if there's one of the panelists who wants to take a stab at that and talk maybe what are the possibilities of that, any possible drawbacks, um, feel free. Well, I can start, and, and, and Jim certainly uh, mentioned it. Um, we're starting to see a lot more what we call liaison officers who have connections to um, U.S. NORTHCOM rather than NORAD, because, of course, it's governed by um, a, an agreement that says right now there are two partners. Uh, but, for example, the United Kingdom, uh, Denmark's, who is actually based out of STRATCOM, but is about to switch to U.S. NORTHCOM, is an example. Um, so I, I, I think there are um, ways to get at including more states in this thing called NORAD, um, especially via U.S. NORTHCOM. 
Um, it, it really what uh, NORAD needs more of and the attention is on deterrence by denial, which means they need information and from all domains and from many different sources. So for the time being, I, I think that's sort of how it's going to happen. Over time, you know, no, uh, Jim and I have, just, uh, have argued that the maximalist um, logical consequence of NORAD is to become a North American Defense Command. Uh, and therefore it could have more partners. But I also wanna caution, we often hear that NORAD is the only binational command in the world. Well, you know, Canada and the US have the PJBD, which is binational, the International Joint Commission, that's binational. But what we're seeing in Europe, especially among the air forces with Sweden, Finland, um, uh, Norway and Denmark, and also uh, France and Germany and how they are, organizing themselves to start treating their airspaces as indivisible. Um, I don't think NORAD is going to be the only uh, defense, binational defense command, you know, if it is in fact even now, uh, because a lot of people are seeing that, you know, with the, the rate of threats and the fact that they're 360 degrees um, and you don't have time to be picking up phones and saying, so what are we going to do? Um, this binational organization and sort of uh, disappearing the sovereignty lines in cyberspace and airspace, et cetera, seems to be the direction many states are going. <clears throat> this, is, this is one area Richard talked about and Whitney asked about areas of research. This is one area that really has to be looked at very closely. And, but it's interesting, our attempts to get support for it over the years have no, always failed. So no one wants to seem to really want to walk down this path, but it's something that's on the table. Uh, it's very clear. Uh, to just put in a technological threat environment context, the old North Warning System radars stretching across the North, Northern Canada, in the Alaska, Northern Canada, down Labrador, really couldn't reach out to that area on the east side of Greenland in the northeast and north of Greenland. Uh, nor was there considered a threat environment or a threat that would emerge from Soviet long range capabilities actually going that way. It was really a single vector, north-south. The new radars, as far as I understand, and of course it's all classified, the new radars that are going in, both in terms of the American over the horizon radar, which will be located probably somewhere in Maine, Cape Cod probably it'll go into, the one in Southern Canada, uh, purportedly will be able to reach over all of Greenland and pick up what's air activities, cruise missiles, potentially, and I don't know how well it works, it's gonna work against hypersonics that are tracking down the east side of Greenland. <clears throat> In all the principles of NORAD that you go back is, the idea is to push defenses forward as possible to intercept them and by, by and large to give you more than one intercept attempt. Launch points of Russian cruise missiles, long range cruise missiles, both air and sea based, are now more and more sitting off the east coast of Greenland. So that's a problem that has to be managed in terms of how then do you deal with, and I'm going to talk Greenland specifically, Greenland, the relationship of Greenland, which is the relationship with Denmark, into a thing we call NORAD particularly recognizing, and of course, Canada gets berated many times, mostly by the academic world looking at this and others, that we really don't invest enough resources in defense. We really were relying too much on the United States. Well, if that's the case, and we still have NORAD, which has worked very well for us, uh, Denver, Mark, basically has little, if any, resources to devote. Uh, they are a very small military, and as Andrea pointed out, like all the Europeans in the NATO problem is that they're looking either directly north or east. They're not looking west and they have other strategic interests in terms of it. It doesn't mean that you, and, and I think it would be difficult for a variety of political reasons and important to remember Greenland is autonomous, but its defense and foreign policy is the responsibility of the Danish government. So they have that dicey little thing to manage how they do that. Uh, you can imagine not a formal expansion of NORAD, but certainly bringing NORAD under, bring Greenland underneath NORAD, the idea of perhaps the need for forward operating locations in Greenland, going back to some World War II stuff, 
they have looked at it, NORAD. So how then the relationship, how do you manage this? And which is raises questions of whether it's in Canada, in, Canada's interest or the American interest to actually uh, acquire and expand NORAD or an expanded area uh, where it can undertake defensive operations. Those are the big questions. And one could refer back to the, what I think the one example of what might happen is Iceland. Iceland is no armed forces. NATO uh, is a member of NATO. So NATO provides its protection. But in reality, throughout the Cold War, the Iceland question was a bilateral American arrangement. And you can have this. And that's the nice thing about Greenland and the NATO umbrella. You can stuff it all into the NATO umbrella, call it NATO. But in reality, it's not. Mm -hmm. So that's some of the issues involved. And just jumping from what Jim says, I mean, I think one of the areas we really need to pay attention to is the Joint Forces Command Norfolk, which is twinned with the Second Fleet. It seems to be expanding beyond just uh, maritime uh, missions. And so we have a NATO headquarters nested in North America. That's never happened before. Uh, and so what is that going, what is the impact going to be of that on NORAD? Um, I, I really want to dig more into that because I think it's, it, it's important and evolving uh, relationship and command and control challenges. Thank you both. We are nearing the end of our time. So does anyone have a last burning question they want to get off their chest? Whitney, your camera's turned on. So I thought, you know, maybe. <laughs> oh, I'm always good for a question. Um, so Andrea, Jim, Nick, you were all in Colorado Springs last week for the NORAD 65th, 66, 65.5 anniversary, whatever we want to say. Would any of you have any reflections on something surprising that came out of the discussions or the activities there uh, around the, the Homeland Defense Institute workshop? Anything surprising or any questions that came out of those discussions or those activities sort of as hot button issues that people like Chris and some others might be interested in hearing about? Well, I, I can start and Gabriella was there as well. But, um, you know, Jim and I have been going down to Colorado Springs for a while. And it was always, you know, the NORAD and U.S. NORTHCOM discussion two token Canadians and so the discussion quickly became U.S. Northcom and we kept jumping up and down saying no no, no that's not NORAD and they kept looking at us going what 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 um, we're starting to see that there is a little bit more thought about NORAD, but it still feels like we're playing bowling with gutter guards up. Like it's really hard to get the Americans to jump over the gutter to, you know, like there's a whole other lane you need to know about, which is the NORAD lane. So, you know, stop playing the U.S. Northcom lane and flip over to the other one. So that that's sort of my impression. Yeah, I would just echo. Andrea. And, and Northcom's a beast. I mean, it's a real beast. We don't know. I think we don't understand it. So NORAD, if, if you variety of measures, it's some of this little thing on the margin. Northcom is the game. Uh, and Secretary of Defense Austin, who was wrong because it wasn't a Northcom fighter, it wasn't a NORAD committed fighter. But he was wrong, whether he understood it, what he was saying, or there was political motives, I don't know. So I agree with Andrea. There's nothing that we've seen surprising, uh, but it's part of the danger of what I call the minimalist solution. Unless we start to do something more in terms of simply sending a NAV Canada person to, to these headquarters, which would be a nice start of a little thing to do, uh, unless we start doing more, this is the problem of NORAD becoming more and more marginalist and pushed more and more into its box and told that's very nice. It's like imagine you know, the adult going to the child, patting them on the head. So that's very nice. You're doing very well. Now go away and don't bother us anymore. We got serious business to do. But none of that's new. It's always been sitting there. And we've all, it's always, anyone who's looked at this knows of this problem. And of course it raised, pretty raised its head after 9-11 and the breaks Canada put on uh, NORAD expansion. So I, can, I can't say there's anything new. 
No, no, I have. I just can't see it. We, it's just been there so long. We hang out there too much. We got to go find. We got to go to Norfolk. That's where we're going to go. Norfolk. I haven't, don't hang out. Navy's always interesting. Sorry, I should. I'll be super quick. It was my first time in Colorado Springs, and I had two very general observations. One was the surprise that Canadians weren't included in the classified briefing. Not that I was going to be in there, but in the classified briefing in the afternoon, and that kind of plays into your point. Uh, Jim about Northcom being this beast and kind of in the box. And the second point, very general, was, I don't know why it surprised me, but the complete lack of diversity and women and any sort of minority in the academic symposium on the second day. I think in Canada, especially through, not to plug a different minds network, but through CDSM, they have the uh, undergraduate uh, minority scholarship. And I was just, I was blown away at uh, at what the room looked like on the second day. All right, well, thank you so much everyone for your reflections on the 65th anniversary, the panelists themselves, all of the wonderful questions that were asked. Um, we'll end the discussion there. And thanks so much for attending the event. Thanks everyone.